Hello. We're going to get started. Welcome. Thank you for having me today. I'm thrilled to collaborate and hope that I give you some information that you may have not known before. Uh, maybe it's information that you're brushing up on because you've heard it once, but hopefully regardless of where you're coming from with knowledge level, you'll be able to use some things right away in either your own practice or your students practice in the future uh, and better your own life because of what I'm sharing today. This PowerPoint presentation is entitled Me, an SLP and Laryngology, a Singer's Guide to Vocal Health. I first want to say who I am. I'm Christy Knickerbocker. I'm a speech language pathologist and I specialize in the singing voice. I have a private practice in Fort Worth, Texas called A Tempo Voice Center. And here I treat a variety of voice and upper airway disorders. I do this in person and I also have been doing this a lot virtually since COVID. And I do this because I was originally a vocal performance major at my university, and as I was auditioning, I had a cyst on my vocal cord. I was having pitch instability issues, so there were about three pitches that I couldn't stay on, and so I went to perform, actually, and the judge who was at the contest said, there's something really wrong with you. You need to go see an ENT. And it's funny because I had not known uh, that I needed to do that. I had kind of suspected that something was really wrong, but me as a singer and a young singer, I was very afraid uh, to find out what it might be. Uh, but I eventually had voice surgery to remove the cyst and voice rehab with a speech therapist, with a speech language pathologist. And my biggest worry was, is this lady going to know anything about singing? I was petrified, but she did. She was wonderful. And now I feel called to help others with voice issues. And so I changed majors to speech pathology. And now I do this for a living. This is some free information. If you're ever bored or just curious, uh, on my blog, I write about voice science, I write about singing, I write about uh, warm-ups, I write about new research articles that are coming out. So you don't have to spend hours trolling PubMed to find out what's going on. I do that hard work for you and try to make it easily digestible so you can read it on your phone wherever you are. Also, I'm quite active on Instagram. My handle is uh, the at sign and Christy underscore voice. And I have some funny antics and again, easily digestible voice science stuff that you can learn about and look more on as well. And then I also have uh, a Facebook for my company, a YouTube channel that's kind of a crapshoot of things on which you're going to find, and then Pinterest uh, with resources and downloads and videos and blogs. And then if you want some free things, you can go to autempovoicecenter.com slash join our voice community with dashes in between each word and get free downloads and get up-to-date information. Whenever I release a new blog, if ever, I, if ever I release a new product, usually it's with a discount, um, you get those emails. So let's first start uh, with what is ENT slash otolaryngology. Maybe you've used these terms interchangeably. If so, you're right on. Uh, maybe you think that this is a completely different sect of physician. They're actually the very same thing. Otolaryngology is just the fancy word for an ear, nose, throat physician. And then we shorten that to ENT. And that is not the same as an EMT. So uh, someone who would show up in an ambulance if you were in a car accident. But these physicians diagnose and treat anything related to upper airway disorders, upper respiratory issues, uh, nose or breathing ailments, swallowing problems, ear issues, and if you start having voice issues. Uh, usually, not always, your primary care physician refers you if they suspect you need specialized care. So that tier usually looks primary care or, or PCP to ENT. And then if it's something that the general ENT feels like needs specialized care or if there are, the, the stakes are really high, uh, they send you to a subspecialty of ENT that we'll talk about. 
that subspecialty of ENT, that's a lot of T's, uh, is laryngology. And it treats only the, the disorders of the voice. So this is somebody who not only does their residency um, kind of in general ENT, but they actually have a fellowship of laryngology where they're following another laryngologist for much of their training so they can learn uh, assessment, they can learn treatment, and they can learn surgical techniques that are specialized to laryngology. Now, most ENTs have some experience with voice, so you're not going to find an ENT that's never heard a horse patient, right? But some have very little. They are generalists in a sense. They maybe specialize in plastic surgery. They may specialize in audiology. Um, so they're doing the ears. Uh, you, it, there's another crapshoot where you are in the care of an ENT. They may say that they have experience with voice disorders, but they may have not done a very common surgery for a laryngologist. Um, that ENT, may, the general ENT may not have done that in many years. So it's important for you as a singer to do your homework and understand in your area, where are the ENTs and who is a laryngologist? Because if you Google some of these physicians, they come up as otolaryngologist. Um, but they, they have a subspecialty. Um, they're a tight knit community. These laryngologists, they really push the borders of care, uh, for the betterment of their patients. Um, they're doing all kinds of new surgeries all the time. Some exams provided by ENTs or laryngologists are mirror exam, flexible endoscopy, video stroboscopy, and high speed imaging. So you will find most every ENT, so otolaryngologist, is going to have training in administering a mirror exam. This is literally where they take this mirror that you're seeing, this little blue one, they're usually uh, stainless steel. They look in your mouth with it, they stick it to the back of your tongue, and they say, oh, looks like you got something there, okay? Really difficult to see. You probably might gag unless they administer some sort of topical anesthetic, um, but you're not going to see a lot with that. Uh, as far as really fine detail. So you may say with good confidence, there's something growing there. You need to get that further analyzed. Um, but if you are a singer and your care provider is just providing a mirror exam, you need to go see a care provider who has more sensitive equipment like a flexible endoscopy. So that's the next step up. So that's what you see pictured here. Uh, in this top picture where I have the scope in uh, Daddy Pete's nose. That's my grandpa. Um, he uh, is a good guinea pig. And this is a, an exam that gives us picture of gross motor movement. You're either looking at the person's vocal cords with a camera, like you see on the screen, or you have very simple, just the scope that has a built-in light and the ENT puts an eye to the end of the scope and just looks. There's no recording of it, there's no evidence of it. You can't see what's going on. You just have to go off of what they say. So uh, I implore you to either use a flexible um, video stroboscopy or a rigid video stroboscopy, which is the third thing you see here on the bottom right. Um, Remy's performing a rigid video stroboscopy and we can see with the strobe light the very fine motor movements of the vibratory dynamic vibratory dynamics of the vocal folds um, high speed imaging so video stroboscopy is really great at diagnosing what most ENTs would say eh it's reflux take some take some reflux meds you'll be fine or rest your voice voice rest that's good right um, we've heard that a lot uh, but uh, video stroboscopy really allows us and is more widely available nowadays um, to better assess somebody. I saw somebody this past week, ENT, two ENTs, had been giving this person uh, proton pump inhibitors, so reflux medications, and the person is like, that's doing nothing. It's making it worse. Um, we did video stroboscopy. This person was very young, um, so I was not expecting to find what I did, which was like both sides, so bilateral, 
little divots or, or sulcus. So there was atrophy actually happening in the vocal cord tissue. And the person was thinking it was all in his head. He was like, it's gotta be in my head. It's stress. And I was like, it's actually not. doesn't mean that stress isn't a component of what you have going on, but there is something physically going on with your vocal cords that is impairing the ability for them to function correctly. So um, those types of patients that can get an answer, it's life-changing for them. Also, uh, we'll touch on high-speed imaging. This is not widely available yet, but it has great views. You can see different camera lenses. It's like very, very cool. So um, I assume hopefully in the next few years, that'll be more widely available. It's just very, very expensive machines. So we talked a little bit about um, the difference between mirror exam and flexible endoscopy, but here are some hard facts. The mirror exam is common. It's kind of antiquated though. Uh, if you're really concerned um, about what that physician saw, you want to look for a physician that's going to provide you a more comprehensive exam. Um, but in, if someone's really just looking to see, if, is there cancer or not, um, this might be helpful for them. Maybe they go to the ENT, they're not a singer, they, don't, they aren't a professional voice user. Um, maybe that's all that they need. The flexible endoscopy is the scope in your nose. It does give you a better view. Um, again, they're using a light a attached to the camera or a light uh, where the physician looks with their eye. It's a grainy picture if it's a cheaper scope. And I mean cheap, it's still like thousands of dollars for the, the cheaper scope, but um, it definitely is better than a mirror exam. And then here's a, a little rundown of the differences between the flexible endoscopy and then video stroboscopy. So sometimes people get confused about video stroboscopy um, being just rigid. It's actually has nothing to do with the scope itself. It's all about the light. And so the light uh, talks to a microphone that's held close to the patient's neck. That microphone provides the machine with pitch data. So it takes the pitch into consideration and then it tell the pitch tells the light when to flash. So it takes different pictures at different points of the vibratory cycle. Then it splices those pictures together to allow us to see kind of a slow motion. We would never, ever, ever be able to see every single um, uh, vocal fold closure. That's happening hundreds of times a second, but it kind of feigns that we can, we can see a lot better um, with this technology than with our naked eye. So scared? I hope not. I was though. So, I mean, I don't know who I'm preaching to. It's like I was, I was there with worries myself. Um, there was an article uh, by Cohen and his uh, colleagues. I think Nelson Roy was part of this study in 2015 where they said, we want to find out if video stroboscopy is really as good as we think, which we know it is, but let's get some data. So they looked retrospectively um, at a group of people who had been to see a general ENT and then people, and, and they'd received just um, either a mirror exam or a flexible endoscopy. And then they had those people go and get video stroboscopy following. They looked at, at who had done that. 51% of the time after that video stroboscopy, the diagnosis was changed. 83% of those diagnoses were laryngitis initially. So that tells you that if the issue is still bothering you after the doctor has said it's laryngitis, it'll go away, just rest your voice, you need to probably seek better care um, or a better exam. So let's talk a little bit about how ENT and laryngology work with singers. Would it surprise you to know that many laryngologists are singers themselves? They have a calling to care for those who sing. Many of my colleagues who are laryngologists all over the country and all over the world sing. Some of them don't, and uh, you don't have to be a singer to be a laryngologist, but I think it helps. And the patients who I've seen who sing for a living always tell me that they feel better knowing that their physician sings. They feel like they're understood. They feel like there's going to be great care taken because it's a very frightening thing to have a problem. And it's interesting because you think, oh, you see all these singers and um, that must be so cool. It's actually sad because the time when I see these singers is the scariest time in their life. Like they are 
in a hard place. So um, it's not always exciting. It's like, I, I'm the detective. I say, here's, here's what I'm going to help you do. And I understand the scared feeling that you have, the worry, and we're going to get through this together. Um, laryngologists can be preventative. They can provide baseline exams. Uh, if you know right now that you're going to be a vocal athlete for life. Um, and then I think another thing to let you know on not all problems require surgery. So there is an argument for voice rest, um, but you're not always going to have to go under the knife for the voice problem. So I think singers are scared. They're going to just drop me in the operating room and I'm going to have, you know, a botched surgery and I'm never going to sing again. And they just think I'd rather not know. Right. Um, so just knowing that. But what does the American Academy of Otolaryngology recommend? If you have a voice change, and if you're a professional voice user, you're likely very aware of how you sound. Um, if that change lasts longer than two weeks, you probably would be advised to go and get that checked. People ask too, is the ENT or the laryngology treatment different for non-singers? A little bit. Uh, but but the, the big answer is no, but the tiny answer is yes. There are multiple things um, ENT or laryngology can do differently for singers. Um, time considerations. So um, these patients who come in who sing for a living, um, whether they're trained or not, they may be signed and not trained, they may be super trained and not signed, um, but these physicians really take into consideration the time uh, that it takes to treat these singers because the voice is the livelihood. The voice is the moneymaker and um, they will take the time with you that you deserve and need. Um, they also take into, into consideration vocal demand. So if you're on tour, if you have a lot of gigs coming up, and I say all of this with, you know, the, the possibility and hope that things will go back to some sort of uh, normalcy post-COVID. It's just looking like years and years and years of potential changes for everybody. Um, but they look at if you need to use your voice, they will work with you and compromise on recommendations and come up with some realistic ones that you can meet. Uh, they're not going to say, well, if you don't do this, I'm not going to treat you. Uh, also, they know that there's a possibility you're going to lose income with the things they're recommending. So it's just like a sports injury. If you have an athlete uh, that gets injured on the football field and they get drug off and taken back to be examined, that athlete's going to say, can I play? And the doctor has to make a tough call on that. Um, so a lot of times we are suggesting a conservative approach, um, but we understand that there's some wiggle room with that because not everybody can follow recommendations to a T. Um, and then oftentimes the ENT and laryngologists work hand in hand uh, with a voice specialist, speech pathologist um, with singing experience so that the aftercare, pre-surgery care if needed, uh, aftercare can be completed. Um, so prevention of anything happening in the future. So what is uh, the approach that you might get if you have voice issues? Uh, the physician's going to potentially recommend reflux medications right out the gate. Uh, there's not a whole lot of issues with um, using a proton pump inhibitor uh, for a short-term period of time. There is some research about osteoporosis risk for cis females uh, following, I think, over a year's use. Uh, so they might treat with that. They might treat with antacids. They might treat you with sodium alginate, which is a kelp-based product that forms a little raft at the top of your stomach to keep reflux episodes from happening. And while we're on the topic of reflux, I do want to just mention that in popular culture today, when we hear the word reflux, we usually think acid reflux, right? Um, I know I did. And there is actually, there are actually more components to your stomach fluids like pepsin and bile that maybe an irritant to your larynx if you're having those episodes. So it's important to know what the medication is that you're taking and how that medication works so you can best help yourself 
Um, cause you may not have hot burps. You may not have heartburn, um, dysphonia or problems with your voice may be the only thing that you are experiencing as, um, as a result of reflux. The physician might give you allergy medications. The physician might give you nasal sprays and then steroids, right? Who has said, you know, just shoot me up because I got this show tonight. <laughs> um, if you get steroids, you get this false sense of security. You feel great. Your voice is going to sound wonderful. Um, but you will crash after that leaves your body and um, you have the potential for putting yourself at risk or completing vocal athletics more than you would have um, without that shot. And uh, you may have done some damage during your performance. So just with caution on all of that, um, support professionals that you might be referred to and good to understand about is gastroenterology. If you have reflux issues, they're going to send you to GI. If you have breathing issues, they're going to probably send you to a pulmonologist. That's a lung doctor. Uh, they're going to potentially send you to speech language pathology. And they are going to want to, just like I want to in my practice, uh, collaborate with your voice teacher or your voice coach. It's extremely important that everybody's on the same page. We may speak a little bit of a different language, but we're all treating the same thing. And so I think that interdisciplinary collaboration is very, very important. Whew, that's a lot of info. So let's talk about some fun facts. Uh, what I want you to just know is that if you're inhaling corticosteroids, so this is like um, asthma medication, okay? Or if you have bronchitis and they're giving you um, some steroids to help with the inflammation. If you're not, sometimes even if you do rinse your mouth after administration, but even um, if you do, uh, you might get a fungal or yeast infection growing in your larynx, okay? Um, so you may have some bad irritation, you may have laryngitis, and it all has to do with your... Um, the medication you're taking for another issue. Uh, I get asked about singing when you're sick. So if you're taking aspirin, if you're taking ibuprofen, there was a, a Nats chat in 2014 where Dr. Sadaloff or Bob Sadaloff did a, a talk and he talked about drugs and finding that chat was really enlightening for me because I was able to learn that aspirin interferes with platelet function and can put you at risk for vocal hemorrhage for a long time. That stuff, the half-life of aspirin, it stays in your body for a long time, for seven to 10 days. Um, ibuprofen, that's going to thin your blood, um, killing the pain, but thinning the blood and putting you at risk for vocal hemorrhage as well. But it leaves your body relatively quickly. So usually you're only at risk for about 24 hours um, from what Bob was saying, Dr. Sadaloff. And birth control, Interestingly enough, if you are cis female, um, newer pills have less effect on the voice. So you may have noticed that if you're taking birth control, your voice sounds one way. Um, if you get off of the birth control, your voice may have some changes. So there is an effect there that I think needs to be noted. Um, if you have laryngitis or you have a cold, uh, blood vessels are dilated and they're very delicate. Um, so I think understanding why you have no voice why you're having this issue will help you better understand um, why it's hard. Uh, your vocal folds with laryngitis, laryngitis is not a virus. That's another thing I want to tell you. Laryngitis is a description. It's inflammation of your larynx, which could include inflammation of your vocal folds, vocal cords. With fat, clunky, heavy vocal folds, it's really hard to get them to vibrate. And so if they're so full of fluid, um, you're trying to push through, you're really having them slammed hard together. And so they're already in a state of, of illness, and then you're asking them to do more acrobatics than they would normally. So it's so hard when someone says to me, but I have a show, and I'm like, yeah, but you're also sick. So... It's, it's, a, it's a hard conversation to have um, about what's best for that person. Also, another little tidbit for cis females, menstruation, your vocal cords are going to swell during the premenstrual time. So I encourage you not to take water shedding pills because the protein-bound edema, that's swelling, fluid will not be expelled from those water shedding pills. And that's going to just take away the lube that you need to have your vocal folds not create a bunch of heat from the friction. 
uh, during vibration. So they're going to be susceptible uh, to damage from overuse. And that's another uh, tidbit from Bob Sadoloff's uh, Nats chat that was listed earlier. So let's talk a little bit about vocal health and wellness. Um, what is vocal hygiene? Have you heard that? What do you, what do you think vocal hygiene is? Um, we're kind of phasing out of this terminology in favor of um, optimization, hydration, and prevention. So we can really categorize that as vocal wellness, um, ergonomics. And while hydration is important, there is no good rule. It's per person. The first thing I think most people think about when they think voice care uh, is hydration, but it's so much more involved than that. And you might even as wellness consider speech pathology services for vocal efficiency and optimization. And this can be for speech. This can be for singing because you don't change out your singing vocal cords for your speaking vocal cords. Uh, so it's all, it's all connected. And I think um, if I had a dime or a dollar when we worked um, with a singer on speaking voice, when the problem fixed itself in the singing voice, it's wild how things are connected and we don't think about anything we're doing when we talk if we've had singing training. It's like it's different. There are four great um, tracts for uh, voice rehabilitation, but there is a great argument for using these for habilitation or vocal vocal disorder prevention. These include resonant voice technique, stretch and flow, semi-occluded vocal tract exercises, and vocal function exercises. You have likely done a lot of semi-occluded vocal tract exercises during your voice lessons. You just didn't realize they were called this. And you didn't realize that there's a family, maybe. And maybe you didn't realize that there's different and varying levels of back pressure that occur then with them. So let's go, let's dive into each of these in detail. Uh, resonant voice therapy, a resonant voice technique. This has roots with um, two men, Mark Madsen and Arthur Lessig. Um, speech language pathologist Kitty Vertolini Abbott uh, was a pioneer and really packaged this, researched it, uh, and then distributed that information so that we as speech pathologists could start speaking the same language and we could make this replicable so that our patients could benefit and we could really find out what about each component is making the biggest difference. The base of this is a forward focused hum with a relaxed larynx. We're using this to help increase efficiency of breath, vocal full vibrations and resonance, as well as to decrease strain. So I bet you didn't realize right then, as I was demonstrating, I was also getting my voice back to where it felt normal because I've been speaking for a little while. So the best part about delivering voice therapy is that when I'm demonstrating, I'm performing it for myself, truly. Um, to know if you're doing it correctly, feel, you feel vibrations in the front of your face and it feels easy to perform. I'm going to caveat that with easy here, maybe not easy here when you're learning it, um, but it eventually should feel very easy in your, in your brain the more you do it. This goes from a uh, basic training gesture of that mm -hmm to M chanting, M words, hum, mum, 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 ma, some babbling like that, and then eventually to phrases and sentences, my mom mails me money. And then you can advance to using resonant voice technique with 100% of accuracy to a, uh, able you to uh, create sound while you're warming up and then fade it down to maybe 50 or 60% of that because if you talk like this, people will think you are on drugs. Promise. <laughs> um, but learning how to do that at 100% and then tailoring it back down is something a speech pathologist can help you with. Another technique is stretch and flow. This has roots with Ed Stone and Robert Castile. It's the only approach that we know of yet um, to reduce laryngeal tension that eliminates voice. Um, so that means it takes it down to a whisper, kind of. Um, but it keeps articulation, the movement of your lips, teeth, and tongue, 
and breathing intact. And then the voice gets added back in. So it's perfect because um, it reduces vocal fold collisions being so hard um, or even at all, and then decreases strain. Uh, and it retrains sometimes uh, compensation patterns that people have when they are squeezing too tight with their larynx. So the base of this is, is knowing you have airflow at your lips, your vocal folds are parted and it's overly breathy. So you start with this air only, you advance to counting because it's easy on your brain. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then you start to add about 20% sound. Ooh, one, two, three. And then you can drop the tissue. And we usually use this to help our patients post-surgery to help them not whisper or they're performing some constriction that might lead to poor habits later on. We replace that with stretch and flow because it's easy breathy sound and it has kind of a yawn style throat to help them uh, heal and uh, reduce collision impact. Semi-occluded vocal tract exercises. These are uh, roots and research from many others, but mostly pioneer in the field, uh, Dr. Ingo Tietze. And the base for this and the science behind it is a back pressure that is uh, alternatively dubbed inertive reactants. Uh, but this back pressure helps the vocal folds not collide as hard. And it's funny because the resonant voice technique, the humming that I mentioned a few slides ago, is actually a type, a subtype of semi-occluded vocal tract exercises, which kind of makes things confusing, but I hope not. Uh, this is used to help increase efficiency for breath, vocal fold vibrations, and resonance. So it helps kind of balance those systems among themselves again and to decrease strain. You know you're doing this correctly. If you feel back pressure after completion, uh, you should feel different. So you're phonating one way or you may be singing one way, you administer the SOVTE, and then you come back to singing or vocalizing and you should feel effortless. It should feel a lot easier um, to do. These are some types of semi-occluded vocal tract exercises. So the first is straw phonation. So this can be with straws of varying length and diameter. What's going to help you get different feelings is changing the diameter. That's what matters. Might make it feel very different than but as long as you have airflow coming out the straw, you're doing it correctly. There's another uh, type called um, Lax box, um, but straw phonation in a, in a cup and bubbles in a cup is what I call it too, where you're sticking the straw in water. And what you can also do, uh, paper straws work, plastic straws, metal straws, um, but then you can have these larger tubes as well. And then you can actually stick them deeper into the water um, and create uh, the bubbles in a cup as well. Semi-occluded oo for blowfish, that looks like this. And then you pop a little air through your lips. Where nothing's coming out your nose for these, okay? Just like the straw, nothing's out your nose. Um, you can do glissando. You can do accents and hills and glides. Also considered a semi-occluded vocal tract exercise, something you've probably done in voice lessons since you can remember. That's your tongue trills and your lip trills. But none of these, until what I'm about to introduce to you, have afforded you the ability to actually sing your songs. So with words, so maybe you wanna sing your aria or your song uh, with some back pressure to help you warm up. Grab a cup. I use styrofoam because it's easier to poke the hole in the top. Start small, and then you can uh, make it larger as you try and see what's good for you. So there, I made it a little bit larger. Um, the, the cup doesn't have to be styrofoam, though. You can have a plastic cup that you use all the time or even a metal one. Uh, you're going to put this completely on this yeah, yeah. where you see your cheeks kind of puff out, and then you can sing your song. Is it a charity, is it a charity? 
And then you can remove it. And then continue singing. So you could do a whole song through this, um, but it really allows you to practice your words, uh, but provides some safety net for your uh, vocal cord tissues. Same principle, but if you don't have a cup or you hate the cup, a lot of my sopranos are like, it vibrates and I hate it. You can wrap your hands around your mouth. I do the same thing. So build up that pressure um, and create that. Phonemes, so sounds of a language. M, N, and ing. Phonemes, U and E. And then you also have the option to do kazoo phonation because that will, with a post-it note, give you feeling as well. Where you feel vibration in the post-it note and uh, you're already kind of in that U phoneme. The fourth is vocal function exercises. Roots and research here were from uh, Joe Stemple and his team. And what they created was, like Kitty, a replicable exercise routine that they researched. And this creates uh, back pressure as well, that inert of reactants. Uh, it's for injury prevention and rehab. Um, this increases efficiency of breath, vocal fold vibrations, and resonance. We not only decrease strain here while we're doing this, but we improve stamina because many of these exercises you're doing as long as you can. So you're kind of pushing and taxing your system. And then these are prescribed to be done twice through twice a day. So let's go through what these look like. I'm going to demo the, the cis female um, recommendations because they feel better. It's harder for me to do the lower notes. You're going to take F4. And you're going to hold out everything your voice teacher told you never to do. <laughs> this super bright forward nasal E as long as possible. Then you're going to stretch your vocal folds out. So you're going to tilt your larynx all the way forward, lengthening your vocal folds going to a higher pitch. So you're going to glide that though with that blowfish ooh. <gasps> then you're going to come back down and then contract the vocal folds. So the larynx will then tilt back and down uh, this way. <laughs> then you're gonna create a power exercise where you're sustaining five notes each separately, starting on middle C uh, for cis females and then the C below middle C for cis males. Same posture of the mouth. <laughs> You'll hold that out as long as you can. Then you'll do the same thing for D. As long as you can. The same thing for E and F. And then finally G. And then you'll repeat that. So those are all four steps and you would do those twice through twice a day. Um, prescription. Now, if you're seeing a speech pathologist, they may change or modify these for you based on your abilities or what is appropriate for you, but um, that's kind of a basic overview of uh, things you can use for habilitation, okay? Uh, let's talk also about phonotrauma prevention. So phonotrauma, that sounds like a scary word. Uh, it's anything that could cause potential damage to the tender tissues of the vocal folds or the vocal cords. Um, we consider screaming, yelling, talking for long periods of time at an intense volume too, chronic throat clearing or coughing, um, singing with too much laryngeal strain. Now, I hesitate to say belting because belting can be done in a healthy way. Um, and it can be also done in a very poorly coordinated way, just like classical singing can be done the same. Uh, so if you have good training, it's hard to know what good training is though. That's why the voice science is so important, I think. Um, but if, you, if you're doing any of those things, consider that phonotrauma and consider that that's potentially damaging um, to your vocal cord tissue. What do you prevent? Uh, phonotrauma by doing. So proper training. So either a voice coach that you know and trust, um, a speech language pathologist, or working together with both of those professionals. 
warming up and cooling down using the things we just talked about, the resonant voice, the stretch and flow, the semi-occluded vocal tract exercises, and the vocal function exercises. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, there's my phonodrama. A combination um, of resonant voice humming and voice rest can potentially be more beneficial than rest alone if you follow an intense vocal activity with those two things. There's a great, I'm just shouting out one of my blogs um, on that, but, but Kitty Verley Abbott, Ryan Bransky, um, they looked at the secretions on vocal cords and they did so before people talked loudly for 40 minutes, I think it was. And then they said, okay, we're going to split you into three groups. One group will keep talking on the hour for 24 hours. The other group will go on complete and total voice rest. No talking, no singing, nothing. The third group will rest 20 minutes, followed by four minutes of resonant voice humming. And then repeat that cycle. So what they found was that, I think, hypothesis was if the vocal cord... Um, tissues would look better for the rest group versus the uh, talkers. And that was true. But when they compared the rest alone with the rest and humming, the rest and humming had less enzymes present with swelling on the vocal cord tissue. You also need to consider your environment, uh, your diet, if you have risk factors, um, if you're on any kind of drying medications uh, that you have to take for other reasons. Knowing that about yourself would make you make different decisions on vocal use, I think. Also, dehydration. Your choices. If you drink alcohol, that's a drying thing, um, and not enough water, you're likely going to be at a greater risk for overuse than if you had hydrated well and then done the same athletic activity. Um, risk factors can include previous injury. If you know you've had an, an injured vocal cord in the past, it's probably likely you could develop one in the future. And then allergy medications, Mucinex, those kinds of drugs um, can be drying, but sometimes drugs you don't even think are drying um, can mess with you. So I think being aware um, of your body and knowing that is really important. Uh, voice science, why does it matter? Why can't you just sing? I mean, you could. A lot of people do. Um, it's just that research helps us. Research helps us understand why things are helpful why things are harmful, um, so that we know what to recommend. If we didn't have research, I could tell you in this presentation that if you drank this concoction of ginger lemon tea, you could sing injury-free for the rest of your life, and you'd believe me, right? Because I look like I know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> um, but I am giving you the things that have been researched versus um, kind of lore, um, there's something to be said about placebo. If you feel good about drinking your warm water before you go on stage or eating your pizza before you go on stage, do that. You know, that makes you a better performer. You feel better. That, that matters. Um, but as far as injury is concerned, we can't fake injury. Injury happens and we need to know um, as a collective what's going to work better and how to replicate those treatment processes so that they can better help. Like, you can't pop a voice therapy pill, but you can take drugs and they usually will provide the same outcome for a person. So um, we're really, I'm wanting to with this lecture for you all, help you capitalize on your own machine with scientific knowledge. So don't forget to join our email community. I would love to talk with you. Any questions that you may have, you can do that. Um, you can contact me anywhere here. My email is also listed on my website. So uh, thank you so much for having me. I hope this was helpful and I hope that you have a long and wonderful vocally athletic career and uh, you are injury free. <laughs>